Hello everyone, today we talk about Longobard Italy and in particular of its social section during the 8th century. So we made mm, a substantial amount of Longobard history videos, so more or less the broader dynamics that we will discuss today are uh, outlined. We really didn't talk much about the uh, later kingdom, we concentrated mostly in the foundation of the same. And so, with those uh, political and social dynamics that started with the beginning, right, and especially mostly terminating, say, from the Longobard um, invasion to the the edict of, of Rotary. So, what what we have left uh, out, and especially from a social point of view, is the developments of Longobard kingdom during the, the later phase of the king, whereas, you know, mostly when Longobard history is not very treated uh, in popular culture, which is also kind of strange, objectively. But in general, um, you know, the, the focus is concentrated on this, um, you know, ideal and actually non-existent, historically speaking, ethnic tension between the idea of the invaders, of, of the Germanic element, of the Romance element. When we get a closer look, we see that essentially by Rotary's time already, um, Longobard, uh, Longobard Kingdom had uh, completed its phase of, um, you know, of consolidation, of affirmation, and the same uh, blending of the of the local uh, population and the 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 Germanic invaders had de facto already occurred. If anything, <laughs> the edict is written in Latin, uh, among the other things, but it's not just that. We, we know pretty well what were the political institutional mechanics that had you know, occurred at the time. We know very well how the administrative system worked. Um, and historiography mostly painted a negative picture of the Longobard Kingdom, mostly for, for this, um, you know, focusing on the very beginning of its history, which was not even so dramatic as, you know, for example, the Gothic War, or, you know, even especially for the local population. Um, and, um, and the latter phase, the, the, the Carolingian conquest, and therefore this kind of, you know, prototype of the Longobard as the, the defeated, the conquered, the somewhat the opponent, even of, of the Franks in a broader, uh, you know, ideal system, eventually was resumed in the lower Middle Ages. Also, for, for other reasons that, were still connected to, to the perception of Italy, especially in France, and uh, that in part, as we will see today, were set you know, in a socio-economical sense since longer times. It actually were a quite positive phase for the Italian peninsula, um, contrary wise to what is commonly uh, thought, um, and that actually show uh, essentially the most civile uh, development of any Latin Germanic kingdom, historically speaking, um, and of, in fact of a dramatic uh, level of, uh, you know, centralization for, for Western standards at the time, uh, which was um, due essentially to the very evenly a, a distribution of wealth that had uh, occurred after the Longobard conquest among the population that would confer in fact to the Italic kingdom historically those characters that are were very well known that we, we have seen from many points of view, political, juridical, military point of view that will make what is kind of surely the communal age uh, that surely drew from the Longobard past a lot of its civile character. Later on, those characteristics of humanism and the Renaissance. Um, and yes, these phase, phases are connected. So today I will not spend myself, because I already did it in the other videos, to debunk all the, the myth of the, you know, the Nefandissima Gents. I created a video that is, that is titled exactly like that, to, to explain how it was created, was founded, how historiography got itself wrong, and how, by the way, from, I think, half of a of a, of a century, if not more, the historiography on the Longbirds is univocally, uh, you know, past, you know, any kind of those, those, those beliefs. Whereas in popular cultures, these uh, 
grotesquely remain, revealing the, the appalling low level you know, of education and, and information in general that, that people have on, on Longbird history. And today we look at two aspects, mainly um, the aforementioned, uh, as a consequence, at least indirectly, as the, the lack of what you could probably call as a nobility in a hardcore sense, like it was otherwise quite present in Latin Germanic Europe, um, in the face, uh, essentially, in fact, of a greater degree of public and civil development of the Longobard Kingdom. And the, um, on a socio-economical level, an important passage that would fundamentally make of the Italic Kingdom uh, a kingdom populated by free men historically during the Middle Ages, differently from, from other uh, countries north of the Alps, where more or less everybody was somebody's serf, factually. Um, and um, and uh, on the ground of properly the passage from the ancient serfdom slash slavery, de facto, especially from a juridical point of view, to the um, to free farmers, right, to what were called Massari at the time. It's also the development in land conduction of the uh, fact of the Mansus that, you know, it's a, con it's a term that uh, is generalized eventually by the Carolingian uh, period, historiographically, because, you know, more or less also, well, the same Italy came to be part of, of the Carolingian Empire and so on, but that was a pretty standard Middle Latin term for defining these uh, land, it was a land uh, unit measurement, of land parchment, land, land plot, that um, shows how in Italy the small and medium mm, uh, private property was something uh, flourishing and that in fact, especially during the 8th century, as part of the cause of the revival, as you know already at this time in early medieval Europe of economy after the let's say, the depression or the stagnation of the previous centuries that in these cases are maybe just 150 years. So that's all what the alleged dark ages that weren't dark at all, by the way, if not for the lack of documentation part, um, as a, were about. As a matter of fact, the dark ages were mm, actually a much more peaceful period than, than basically the rest of the Middle Ages for that matter. So... You can't quite see that, and, and actually the Longbird Kingdom is a very good example of this. So I would like to expand on multiple, uh, say, on, on more topics regarding to this broader frame, because I perfectly know that the first reaction every time I say this, even though it's not happened on Schwerpunkt after having talked about the Longbirds, but in general it's considering the Longbirds as these broods and somewhat, you know, uh, detached dominator, th th this is this is not a, a historical thing, right? It never happened. There is no no evidence of these, uh, you know, oppressions, persecutions, um, I'd say, uh, rigid separation. And this is the, the, the consequence of what the Gothic War had produced, by the way, that favored, in fact, enormously, even the establishment of a longer kingdom in the first place, exactly because society was not tormented like in the other uh, the other Latin Germanic uh, countries by the presence largely of um, of a still a, an oligarchy that would essentially mess up any monarchic plan look chiefly you know at Gaul and Spain where the, in fact the Roman estate uh, had remained uh, as the, the base for that or and or the basically the lack of any public culture like mostly look at Anglo-Saxon England and though is is actually similar more similar in, in pattern to, to Longobard Italy than in fact Gaul or Spain for that matter. And anyhow, um, so if we look at, so in another bit of background on the 8th century specifically, so this is the, in a way, the acme of Longobard power, right? Uh, the, the 8th century here is um, started with the figure of Lutbrand, who was effectively the greatest king of the Longobards here. The country had fully Catholicized. Um, the uh, the Longobards were f co completing the conquest of the Italian peninsula. And they were actually not even in just mm, you know bad terms with the church. That's yet another myth that in fact was stressed. Nor with the Franks that historically would consider the Longobards being of all the peoples that eventually conquered the only ones that 
be considered as peers, right, in the first place, and which is proven even, of course, of not just of the assumption of the Longobard crown by the side of Charlemagne that otherwise would just rule over other peoples that were not inter institutionally integrated in that fashion, but also probably of this massive administrative system that was light years ahead compared to anything that was present in uh, an otherwise com in a completely privatized system like the Frankish one. And so this is, uh, and of course, Italy was uh, as much also the Longobard one was was heavily urbanized uh, for those time standards. Was it, it so this important level of per capita wealth? It was the highest in the world, by the way, in an ininterruptedly from 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 Roman times, um, and a, a, a revival of traffics, right of monetary economy, as we will see now with, with interesting figures. And was facilitated by the, in fact, the uh, distribution of wealth that had formed without the concentration of great monopolies or oligarchies that um, would bring the, the the aristocracy that still existed uh, to compete with each other only within the wake of the royal of the public institutions. So some offices, mostly in the cities, that were active, thriving, also that had a military character, as we will see now already, and that's already a bit the, the seed of the communal war likeness of the later centuries. Um, and uh, and that wouldn't pose a threat to the king, because the, the long, I don't know, what, what uh, was normal to have in terms of private property for, I don't know, a Frankish, um, you know, a small lord in Gaul was basically, you know, even more than, than what the Longobard king had on his own, and even less, of course, what, what the others had. In the king, um, so the wealth was not so radically concentrated in a fewer hands, like in Gaul. Um, so this brings to to some implications, including the fact that in Longobard Italy, like in any other country, basically at that point, except the Francia, the um, you know the, the, there was no such thing like properly a professional military, like the the Franks were instead nurturing, cultivating, and developing, etc. And, and this also makes you reflect on why eventually the, the kingdom was taken over, which is true for, for the rest of Europe, by the way. But this is yet another thing. Today, we, we don't talk about that. It's just for the sake of reference. And if you're curious about these things, please go check the Longobard playlist that I made. Or the Frankish one, if you're interested in the Frank as well. Hopefully. Um, so, in the 8th century... We also have much greater documentation, so we uh, can, and, and especially in these urban centers, have great activity. We have one of the greatest locks in the history of Western um, uh, Europe, that that is the preservation of the Lucase archives, right? That that provided us from for early medieval history an astonishing amount of sources. Um, as Lucca was, you know, one of the most important cities at the time, and. Um, and its archives were preserved. So we have the lack of seeing this mm, Longobard Tuscan reality, but you know, a section of this this world was. So um and we can trace um in during the eighth century, naturally with the Frankish conquest at the end of the century we, lots of things changed. The world system kind of collapsed in a way. So we, we can follow on two, three generations. Um some restricted familiar nuclei that would be fundamentally the the average of Longobard Italy, like restricted families. So not big clans, right? As you know that the private clientelly system would, would develop. And also in Italy later on was Frankicized in, in that in that sense of you know both political and social sense. And so we just see this nuclei oper cooperating with one another but still being detached properly. And so we can see mostly through donations, charters, things like these, what they were up to. And there is a big deal of documentary practice and written culture in Italy at this time. So uh, the authors of the Liutprandian age um, uh, and great part of the ones of the following generations are people of high social status. Mm -hmm. And this is showed by the entity of the properties properly the possession of churches, uh, the the properties of serfs and handmaiden, uh, the fact that in different circumstances the the goods 
of, uh, with which uh, they endow churches and monasteries come from a uh, concession of the king to these authors. So they, are, they, they were at a very high circle um, and the, we, we see it even from their, the, the titles they held, the same authors, the same witnesses in these charters. So titles like Vir Clarissimus, Vir Magnificus, Vir Devotus, Vir Honestus, Honesta Femina. And these are all titles that also sound familiar if you're, uh, if you're, we've seen it, if you're familiar with properly the late, late antiquity. And so what the titles of the later empire were in terms of these, um, in fact, not better specified titles very often, not even in, in, in Byzantine culture, that by the way had something parallel in the same Italy at the time. Mm -hmm. Were quite similar, but with, were basically the same country as the Byzantines had dramatically, you know, decentralized administration and everything. Um, but uh, there was, of course, this properly this Roman continuity. The Longobard Kingdom was politically and institutionally a completely Germanic kingdom. There was no con commixtion like it happened, I don't know, in Spain or, or even in Gaul by a certain degree with properly Roman law per se. The Longobards never compromised, never tried to inspire themselves to Roman administration or whatever. At best, they considered themselves up as kings of the Romans that they had come to rule, especially if they around this time when they took over Ravenna that had been the Byzantine capital of Italy at that point they came to rule over people that had traditionally remained Roman juridically whereas everybody at this point in the Longobard kingdom was a Longobard juridically right this is very important to stress the complete Germanization of uh, Italian culture under um, a Longobard rule Right, so th this is what would draw, by the way, the, the older nationalist historiography into kind of a, a swamp because uh, not seeing Romans, they thought the Romans were so, you know, uh, being oppressed and uh, brought down and enslaved so much by the Longobards that, that they didn't even figure in the charters. What actually happened is that everybody was a Longobard at the time and that these low social certification actually dramatically favored the problem and the whole Longobard juridical production, you know, administrative system, charters, whatever, shows this beautifully well. So the Romans of which, especially around this time, we, we hear of are mostly those, mm, in fact, Romans that, that were still, with all, even in there, the, 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 the changes in the juridical custom, we know that the Roman law didn't even circulate you know, in the original form anymore. We, we've seen it in the history of law in the same Byzantine world. And uh, they were they were just, you know, such because they could continue their own their own identity. But I don't know if, if Lutbrand himself, if I'm not wrong, was a, a great legislator issued that if, I don't know, two Longobards wanted to make a contract the Roman way, they could. Right? If it was consensual, it was not a problem. Um, and so things would eventually blend in, then the Carolingian conquest occurred and everything, you know, was messed up, but um, anyhow, that, um, so we, when we look at these uh, charters in the 8th century, we see that the majority of the authors and great part of the witnesses is qualified in some fashion. So um, we, we can see by this that, of course, th this is the upper strata of society. And so you would expect from this to see what, what properly the longer burden nobility was about. And first of all, we have a problem because we don't know exactly what uh, sometimes these titles actually mean. As we were saying before, when, when you know, th this is a long burden, a Germanic society, you see a, t a title like Beer Clarissimus, that was a notorious late antique title in the times of the great of the superpower of the senators of the the estates the the large property. It was a completely different world now. What the hell does Vir Clarissimus mean in in eighth century Italy? Unfortunately, historiography has you see generally speaking we can understand what it meant. Uh, the problem is that not even in Byzantine Italy we understand very clearly what that meant, and that was closer to the original Roman. Um, titling, right? And so we can, of course, understand, generally speaking, from the Latin 
mm, etymology of what that means. It's obviously that you know, say clarissimus, it means somebody most famous. Magnificus, somebody that has is more is more affluent in a way. Devotus stands for in fact pious, the devoted in a religious sense. Honestus also stresses kind of a moral value. The same goes see from some women, and this is. Uh, this is also relevant because albeit uh, Longobard law, as all Germanic laws, was, was very strict with uh, about female, uh, um, you know, um, female prerogatives, and they, they were basically uh, the, the, yes, they were somewhat autonomous. They didn't, they couldn't really do whatever they wanted with, without the permission of the Munduald, would detain their mundum, their the control uh, on on their on their personas. Uh, still, this broader social economical you know, well-being, as we will see, will bring to, to an important amount of factual, mm, you know, autonomy. Women often were the destinatories of, of, uh, of donations, of concessions, of inheritances, of, you know, goods, that, that properties. Maybe they were not their own, but it, they could enjoy, um, uh, you know, during their lifetime by by testament. All these things. Um, in any case. Uh, I mean, now it's not important to to stress that how historiography tended to interpret these titles because it didn't even come to a conclusive result. But it's obvious we are talking about some kind of you know importance of of these individuals. But we can at least, however, make three fundamental and clear distinctions. First of all, we see in this in in this community a difference that is evident from the laymen from one side and from the other side the clergy and the monks on the other uh, a distinction that by the way was however uh, osmotic sometimes for example there are some lay attitudes of the clergy uh, in Italy that uh, shows for example they, they could um, they could be married they could have children uh, and even mm, carry out a, a profession like the the notary one right uh, and among the laymen uh, that were so in, in all things let's say um, what actually identified a personal status was not a nobiliar type one but the uh, the exercise of some public office or at a lower level, the, or the distinction between freedom and serfdom. So, from the exercise of public office, we have to stress the individuality of the same, meaning that there was no uh, iner uh, inheritable title in the Longobard kingdom. Uh, of course, uh, at, at, at the top level, like kings, dukes, um, there was the tendency to favor the succession of uh, uh, children, grandchildren, and um, even at a lower level, like the the one of the Gastalds, that were technically these uh, very important public officials that, in some some sense, mirrored the same ducal power, or sometimes even substituted it in in the duchies uh, on behalf of the king. You find yes. Uh, you know, gastles that kind of manage to make their children become gastles locally and similar things. Um, serfdom, instead, was the only true in, uh, hereditary condition. And in fact, one thing that remains very clear throughout all Longobard history, in the, from the 7th and the 8th centuries, is the discrimination between uh, liberty and serfdom. That the freedom, let's say, better, and serfdom that Albeit, as we will see now, free men in part could were depending on some bodies at some levels. In any case, they were free juridically, uh, while serfs were not. And and the this status was not blurred in any way, uh, even by the uh, presence in Germanic law, like in all uh, Latin, uh, Germanic Europe, of the aldeones that were essentially half freemen. Right, um, this this between the, the full free and and the serfs. Um, so when we speak of uh, freedom, sometimes in these charters we find next to this man the title of liber homo, uh, 
so properly free man uh, and uh, implicitly this has always is 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 is, all, is mirrored by other titles that refer to the faculty of bare arms right so such as exercitalis so the men of the army or arimannus also the men of the arm uh, just it's exercitalis is coming from from the latin and ariman here man it comes from from the germ and um and these were equivalents i mean in in all this it had been so also in Ro in the roman world so the, the idea that you as a freeman were not just a freeman properly but there was something sacred in your free uh, freedom right that uh, hired you to to a level of nobility so much that bearing arms was a duty but also a privilege of course uh and as you know the longbirds were like all germanic peoples um, an assembly of, of free men in arms, right? So that even kings were elected, and Longobard Italy is arguably basically the, the only case of successful elective monarchy, functional elective monarchy in the, in the history of, of, of Europe, um, as kings succeeded without a big deal of a problem. They had an effective power and were elected as such. But in theory, by the, the assembly of all the free men in arms, naturally by the 8th century, was mostly you know, some important noblemen in, in the kingdom that had, you know, the, this faculty with their clientels, which existed, of course, but they were, as we've seen before, different, uh, were more, you can argue, democratic with all the anachronism of the term, because they were, you know, this, this power was more evenly distributed. And interestingly enough, very often these freemen are further qualified in terms of possessores, so owners, pro, you know, those who uh, properly owned some goods because, and this was an important principle as well in origin, that freedom and the attitude to participate to the army required a state of non-economical dependency, right? So, in other words, you had to own your own land. Uh, but in some cases, um, the further qualification of a vir honestus, for example, um, indicates him as uh, somebody who is defined by another, by a craft, if anything. For example, blacksmith or a master mason. Many viri devoti also, so they were probably um, connected even in there, not necessarily to a religious stand, were, are further qualified as exercitales, so participating to the army, so this was transversal, so you understand that those titles didn't mess up with their, you know, participation to the army or free freedom, it was just, you know, some further qualification, as we were saying before, unfortunately we can't grasp. And among these men we find, for example, a shoemaker, so kind of an average uh, craftsman, um, and also the, you know, more more elevated figure of a monier. But uh, there is also Vir Devotus that, for example, is declaring himself to be committed to absolve some customary duties, and the uh, and the the, the the work service that is typical of of peasant dependency at the time. So something also of slightly less uh, status. So it's very difficult really to understand from the Longobard laws and charters what at this time terms like viri honesti uh, and devoti, the exercitalis, the arimanni, the possessores, etc. actually mean, right? And so we don't understand what equally what, what happened in late antiquity or in the Byzantine time with the viri sublimes, devoti, clarissimi, spectabiles, gloriosi. There are still present, in fact, in the 8th century in places like Ravenna. And so, uh, you know, some some lands were just next door, like Longobard, Italy, the, the Longobard, the Amaya was mostly, you know, Lombardy, Emilia, Tuscany, all these places were, you know, close to, to Ravenna itself. Um, and they, these titles even if they do not correspond properly to a class, Right, in to anything can can be rigidly identified. So, given that these are also somewhat the upper, uh, you know, strate of society, w this makes it very difficult to to talk of properly as nobility 
uh, about nobility as a defi defined social uh, stratum in, in Longobard is elite in the 8th century, like arguably any other age at this point, because it's it, the horizontal differences were probably more important than the vertical ones in, in this regard, at least by a by higher degree than, than the usual, and to produce this differentiation. Um, it seems, though, and that by the 8th century, the military function was increasing in importance in some way, which, which is interesting, because in my opinion, even though in a, uh, you know, Europe, uh, w during the 8th century, independently from these different macroscopic differences, as we've seen, you could see here between Gaul and Italy, for example, but was going towards a process of uh, oligarchization of some sort, anyway. I mean, that was the tendency, that's what you see, right? You see, you have the migration era, you have basically the the, the the large Roman latifundia that are partitioned among the conquerors or simply with properly by the, the local colonists that, you know, at the collapse of the Roman institutions kind of uh, take over themselves those, those lands. Um, this is particularly evident in Italy. Um, and then, so, there is a moment of more evenly distribution of wealth that is also quite scarce one in the sense by the early Middle Ages the, the surplus was ridiculous, material poverty was quite high and then so with the gradual enrichment uh, of, of society and also by a degree with in parallel with the same you know sometimes with the, the decline of public centralized institutions you have properly the, the more powerful taking over also somebody else's property so you have um, on the longer run this process of oligarchization the, that is frankly, and it's the case of using exactly this adverb, especially, to, that would take over with, you know, towards the direction with feudalism in the first place. Um, so something very, very, very mild is, for, for European standards overall, is happening in Italy too. Um, so there is some role of preeminence um, attributed socially to the habit of ar to armed service that for, for which as we've seen some economical availability was uh, was necessary as much as the condition of freemen um, but yet not even this uh, you know both of these conditions at the time seem as a particularly elite or rigid qualification for example there is the Bishop of Luca Walprand who, uh, at the end of the century, you know, was called to serve in the army because bishops would, um, in, in this context, uh, by call of the king Eistulf. And, uh, and we have this important testament of, of, of Wolbrand, who um, uh, disposed of his goods, in fact, in case of uh, his properties, in case of death, and he, he inserts a, a, a very eloquent and very clear clause about the uh, manumission, the, the, free, the freeing, the liberation of the serfs. Because he says so limpidly, quote, I want that um, the serfs would be, f my serf would be free and um, basically properly free from any patronage in the same level of the men of noble birth. So here nobility is directly equated to freedom itself. So this actually shows by a certain way how, you know, how wide this concept could be by itself and how it was not really an elitary thing at all because, you know, freemen wouldn't be freed to, to become noblemen. <laughs> they were freed to become uh, free to become free. And so the concept of, of nobility and freedom is something that, we, generally speaking, also we're not very habituated because we have completely forgotten us. We've been told the Middle Ages are, you know, there's noblemen and then all the other people. Uh, so noblemen is just ultra elite, you know. Actually not, because if you pick any... Uh, it was the, the origins of these cultures, the Roman, the Germanic one, as a freeman, you were a nobleman. Right, and this concept was much alive in this way, even the, the, in communal Italy by, you know, in three centuries after this, like by the 11th century, eventually as well. 
you realize that the, 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 the communal army of free citizens was equating these citizens to some kind of nobleman because still the idea was that if you were free you, you, you could boast that and this was true of course more evident in a country like that because of course the the elites had never been very strong at the point of you know self-portraying themselves as the elite and the rest of the people just you know and there were elites by the way but still that kind of democratic participation to the army of a urban citizenry was perceived as this is not we're not just you know subservient commoners of somebody we are literally free men in arms and nobody can dictate us law right and we can literally be equals in the you know uh, in, in the negotiation with you know even with a king even with an emperor which was actually the truest meaning of the R Roman and Germanic culture at, at its very beginning um, and not only but at least Roman Germanic because that's the context but this was properly the, the roots of what tribal society had been um, so it's um we see through the charters the spread of these titles in uh, you know urban but also in a, in a rural environment also considering that in Italy the countryside was always connected to the city there weren't uh, areas that you say you know, that there's a world of the forest out there that lives on its own right the, the city is, is is everywhere practically um, and so the uh, what, what you find is that the exercitales so free men we would have the faculty of and of, of serving in uh, of participating to the army are widely present in the villages in the vici as they are called as it emerges from many of these texts um and we've seen a vir devotus so pr probably a freeman that still however could be involved in you know farming mansions peasantry dependency of some sort this could derive from a contract um, but the person was still recognized as a veer so as the as the free man for for par excellence uh, and and we've seen this example of manumission also from the test from from the from the te text from the bishop Walbrand. Um so you you can easily see how fluid these social strata uh, statuses were right even in the country in the city and so on in, in the country it's important because still the majority of the people live there naturally so they were still recognized as such were not outcasts um, so it means that they they had a power in the political and social balance of the kingdom on the own. Um so what is interesting as we'll see now is what takes place also among the serfs because we see basically the same level of mobility in there so the enfranchisements uh, could contemplate the persistency of, of a form of dependency uh, from the ex-master so this this is just like in the Roman world and like basically even in the Germanic world it was the same thing so that there was practically a mundium so a uh, a, a power of protection right um, on on these people um, of, of the masters uh, exercised on the serf that was as it was freed right and uh, an obsequium so some kind of respect and obedience due by this this freeman the, this freedman uh, to his former master which was juridically recognized by the way so that you couldn't really just be totally free but still you had earned your freedom your, your children would be free and so you the thing would eventually dilute over time um, so this is also the reason why the Bishop of Luca insisted so much on the full freedom that he would have granted to his serfs right because he really wanted to make them free completely considering that this would have happened in case of his death when he was leaving for for war against the Franks so this is relevant because especially in the case of a bishop you realize that given as we've seen that the, the titles 
here were not really hereditary, that it was just a temporary power this person had, and probably also his, uh, the one of his serfs, so the, 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 that's a courageous choice, uh, also for the time. Uh, and some serfs and handmaiden could even rise after their enfranchisement to very prestigious mm, positions of independence. For example, in the religious foundations, it's not strange to have some high, you know, uh, some uh, abbot or right, that they had maybe had the, you know, a servile past. Not entirely sure about this, but I mean, um, that tells you again how easy, however, it was to, you know, to do that in the first place. Um, and what we see by the eighth century globally in the from the documents about the countryside and the, the order the daily life there is that the servile condition was gradually mm, emancipating from the heaviest forms of peasant dependency uh, in a frame that contemplates the possession and the availability of the land Right, which was essentially, as we've seen before, the uh, contractual way of assumption of some duties and of the um, judiciary law to do for the revendication of, of liberty. And the possibility to also accumulate a conquistum, conquisitum, excuse me, that is, as the, the term, something you, they, they had conquered, even if they had worked hard for, that is, a fruit of their work that is essentially the medieval version of the ancient uh, servile peculium that was this uh, amount of wealth that a slave had the permission to accumulate uh, in their life in his or life uh, in the ancient world where slavery by the way was even though in different forms still much heavier than it was at this point arguably by the way but on the depending on where surely the the, 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 the latifundia here didn't quite exist anymore so also serfs were just as because there were lesser people there were, there were less people numerically I mean there were more precious human beings because human life in, in, in practice does have a cost as a matter of fact as cynical as it sounds so in early medieval times you have the impression well you know yeah they had it kind of better or even you know even in the ancient world, as you know, being a slave maybe in a tribe was better than being a slave in a latifundium. Really, really, because you know what what we get also from archaeology tells us stories of that you really wouldn't like to hear, um, and and it's more. Let's leave aside what could happen to them physically, but even psychologically, you know what slavery brings to. In in any case, it seems in this case at least where at least there is a a greater well-being than the average. Right by the eighth century, surely a longer bird slave slash serf was faring better than a I don't know a Scandinavian trial on on on, on average, uh, because simply the world they lived in was kind of more civilized, right, richer and and so, on. and and what we see is this further emancipation. That that is really remarkable because it has great, um, you know, very far-reaching. Uh, meaning that albeit gradual is still striking that he used to say this transformation of ancient slavery uh, into something else uh, and together with that the broader system of the agrarian uh, economy so naturally from a juridical point of view the classical triad of the survey that is the, the slaves practically the colonists known in in, uh, in the Longobard laws as the Aldi that is people with uh, restrictions of residence or other limitations of personal freedom that is you know essentially the reminiscence of the older health freemen that was normally attributed to the Romans when the Longobards took over and the freemen properly right so at this point, by the way, the ethnic divide, as we were saying, didn't exist anymore. Not just because uh, 
everybody was a long bird, but because also, you know, uh, the Aldi could be still descendants from from the ancient conquerors, right? They didn't have to be Romans on a regular base. Still, probably there was some ethnic base of that. Um, but in this situation, as we've seen, in this mobility and fluidity, things had naturally changed. Um, so, mm, uh, we, what, this is the point. Like in 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 in, uh, in the time the Longobards had taken over Italy, the uh, older Latifundium had already collapsed. The Gothic War had made it. Right, the same Ostrogoths during the the war against the Byzantines actually freed the slaves. Think about Tosilus said, you know, why do you have to fight essentially for these foreigners that want to keep you? put in, in a latifundium, join the Ostrogoths so that will prom promise you freedom. They have already lived here for, for, here for generations, you know how it works, it's been actually a pacific coexistence, and you will acquire greater autonomy, because the latifundium will, will fundamentally disappear. So when, when the Longobards arrived, Italy was exhausted, and so the latifundium was barely holding together by itself. It was very difficult for the Roman elite to keep things uh, in order. So. You know, the, uh, once the we know that in in Byzantine Italy there were peasants that fled to to the Longobard land because they they knew how better it was to live there than under the Byzantines that by the way were practically just foreigners uh, ruling without even that much of a but in in any case um, in um yeah this is debatable actually because. Of course, uh, the same Byzantine Italy was mostly Italian in nature, but it it um, you know the, the 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 fiscal system there worked much more directly connected to Constantinople, so it was r literally another thing. And in Constantinople, nobody gave a shit about people living in Italy at that point. So of course that that's the point. Whereas the Longobards were there to stay because that was their home now, which you don't destroy if you really want to have a future in. So. That is really how how successful the Longobards were on the long run, or even actually even in in, in the medium run, uh, given this this contrast also, but as a model against the Byzantines. So um, um, the, uh, the the reason there are some 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 strictly agricultural, economical, or market reasons why this. Mm, let's say uh, improvement to the social condition of the serfs occurred. Uh, as a consequence, the rarefaction of market in general, meaning that, um, and, and thus also the, of, of the slave market, because there wasn't much of a traffic of that anymore. Markets were emerging a bit um, everywhere, right? Here we are at the beginning, properly, of that polycentric, um, you know political, social system, and you will see even in communal Italy, where every center was kind of active, autonomous, uh, productive on its own, didn't depend on on, a gr on another power, a bigger system. So, um, what would be the point of fueling, you know, other markets by selling them slaves, for example, if those people were from the same place where you live, they worked the land, and they, they, they just made the local economy improving, right? Um, and 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 also in in a broader early medieval frame, in spite of the increase of you know international trade at this point, it was still overwhelmingly a you know a low surplus. So again, this this need to 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 still make of of the local demographic resources an object of exchange in form of slavery or something was was really not proficuous very much um, and um, and so what we see even demographically speaking when we look at settlements in this phase is that the the local production and organization etc was destined essentially to the to the consumption by the local residents not to a broader and so this also developed a sense of identity among these people that went beyond the social class on a local base, um, and so we we can think that from 
say, from the centrality of the slave system that had occurred when the Longobards had taken over. It's not they, they freed people at all. They actually installed themselves in these areas. They began to rule as lords. And the, if they had found Latifundia, they would have immediately t taken control of them, like it had happened with the Visigoths in Spain or the, the Franks in, 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 in Gaul. Uh, albeit there still mixed with the presence of a local senatorial presence that still kind of blended with them, but eroded royal power as, as a consequence. Here, uh, it, it didn't happen. The same, the same Longobard dukes, etc., installed themselves mostly in the cities, in places that had a, you know, it were not the countryside, were not this great landed properties that you can find, you know, in France, etc. Uh, this, the, 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 the control was immediately civilized. Like, Longobard dukes were literate. They knew the law. They pres presentiated that. They were immediately confronted with a civilized situation. I mean, they they Latinized. They 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 inherited great part of the Roman administration. That had at least in the forms in which it had remained at the moment of the invasion, the Longobards were just like from one to three percent of the Italian population per se. So that was obvious. Um, and, and the, the trend was also obvious, demographically speaking. Um, so, what happens is that at the beginning, they, they begin, of course, uh, as a militarized people to, to rule, uh, to, to maintain differences, divide, and so on. But gradually, what we see by the 8th century is that this system is, is actually leaving space to, to, to a market that has uh, its center in self consumption in, the, in a in the, the business of a peasant family uh, in itself that prevails and increases so there wasn't much of a reason to to hamper this process especially when this was even if the sur surplus was so low in general but still for the time these were some of the places with the highest surplus in the first place so it was important to maintain that uh, fluidity because the market was was freer there was more possibility of investment and uh, of civil development and so on as these general picture basically proves so um, what uh, an important change to, that we can see during the 8th century is that the uh, older category of the colony of the colonists that is very classical sounding thing in Latin that the colony, you know, were those who worked in the Latifundia, originally Roman, free Roman citizens, but that de facto during the, the crisis of, of the empire had transformed into serfs, at least de facto, and that had passed under these rulers uh, equally. Had, um, and that it, it's been identified, generally speaking, with the Longobard Al uh, Aldeonate, let's say, so this kind of, kind of health freeman status, that would I didn't, would be reminiscent of that idea that initially was the long birds that ruled and the, long, and the Romans that kind of were a step above still as as f some f sort of freemen basically still because they were as Romans and and the long birds not mixing juridically the cards but mixing eventually demographically and so that's how everybody became a, a long bird juridically as well but they they didn't need even to claim kind of a lesser state let's say outside of the of the longbird juridical st Id uh, identity itself this is very important because as a matter of fact we don't have a proof of that oppression more we, we don't we see just an elite substitution more than else um, and we see that this change um, with the passage from the colony literally to the Massari and this shift is extremely eloquent because it, it's what um, is the base on which the, the crucial element of the change is based. That is the preeminence of the economical organization of the countryside. Because the term Massari, it was, which is the farmer, comes from the term Mansus, Manso, Massa. That, as we've seen, is uh, this idea of, of a land plot that would became kind of standard in the, in the feudal age as well that in this context is also absolutely equivalent with the term 
casa, that is house. That is to say, to designate the residence uh, of the uh, peasant family business that was held by, we see it in these charters, by husband, wife and their children. So you understand what happened, that the ancient serfs transformed themselves in basically almost free peasants, so much that their status is not defined by this kind of ambiguous uh, juridical status, but the, the fact, um, condition let's say, but by the fact that they actually have a land and work it, and they are therefore evidently uh, not, uh, not, not somebody's slaves and and this is um, um, slow centuries old change right it, it, it took the name of massarization in Latin in the sources we find it as um, amasiamentum in the countryside um, and it, um, it it shows however some important um, Mm, you know, wealth, as we were saying before, the the country had the highest per capita wealth in the world, and I interestingly enough, as serfs still existed, uh, still these people, these Masari, could own slaves on their own, as a matter of fact. So they were the masters. So this process would bring to the l l slow marginalization of servile labor, and even more, the detachments of the serves from the land right and of the uh, men in general from the estate system um, this is very relevant to stress because you know here one could s sound confused by the idea but you said you know the latifundium wasn't there so what we're talking about what we're still talking about the fact, of course that even if the large estates of late antiquity they were enormous they were something of regional scale uh, had collapsed, of course, had made maintain still, you know, in the, is, in the smaller parts that still older system in a way. Throughout these centuries, the thing changes towards, you know, a small land, pro, you know, uh, possession and you know, uh, the autonomy of individuals, and this is a a, a very long term thing indeed, but also quite qualifying and um, uh, properly. Identi identifying one um, in this country because again on the longer run this population would be considered fundamentally as free it doesn't matter how you know eventually the, the francization occurred the feudalism was introduced um, and all these things but fundamentally the base and the same socio-economical base for it would, would remain on the longer run so that I don't know by the time the, the, the German emperors would uh, descent in the peninsula or uh, if you look at France comparatively, well you see that you know in this nor north of the Alps there wasn't this this idea that paradoxically even if those lands had been more kind of primitive in nature and so you would expect kind of a greater personal freedom actually the thing had to happen because gradually without a state without a real public culture the oligarchies even the, the older tribal societies had taken over and and had molded the mindset of individuals in ways for which there were no resources there to 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 to, to have this autonomies to have properly even a state uh, a kingdom that would like the longer one based on the cities with an administration with a direct control from the capital maintain an order an equilibrium a balance there in the mindset it was you were under somebody else by default it wasn't even negotiated right so this was of enormous implications. The same reason why we have seen why the, the Germans wouldn't believe anything they, they would see when they descended in 1154 to bring down the, the, the in, within this the under under imperial power the Italic Kingdom, and they they saw things like I don't know com commoners, the communes, the cities that would dictate law to the nobility in the countryside, the feudal nobility. I mean, there was some, something like a world upside down for them, because they never seen that. And ba large, basically, I, I don't know any other European context, but not even any other world context where this was the case. So it's, uh, I'm sure it existed at some point somewhere, but let's say, uh, 
don't, don't be so sure all that because again these are um, political social balances of extreme delicacy that do not happen really overnight or by chance right this, this is the, the the superimposition of very different conditions uh, that occurred historically that could have easily gone otherwise right easily if I don't know the Gothic War had not existed well Italy would have been like Gaul like Spain right you would have had this massive you know latifundia uh, estates with with an unruly nobility with a privatization of power and surely yeah I mean the urbanization and everything would have brought to a certain you know probably also civil advancement of some sort but the the core of power would have not been a, a publicly framed one like the one in the Longwood King would have not existed some kingdom would have existed so that would have probably arguably maintained on a longer run the Roman um, administration like namely it happened in, in Spain etc but in in practice it would have actually privatized in the forms so and it would have fragmented the thing entirely um, it's 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 very interesting to reflect on this because even the Longobard kingdom would have not in fact existed probably as we know it if um, they had just superimposed to a kind of latifundium situation like the one the Goths found because surely they would have created something similar, but it would have, frag well, that depends on how it would have happened. It, probably a war, but, you know, the, the Longobards were quite unruly. At the, the moment they invaded, they didn't have a sense of themselves. There was a, there was a sense of, you know, anarchy at some point, and, and they stopped electing kings even. So it was a very hard time at the beginning. But because even there, th those were peoples who came from the heart of the barbaricum. They had no idea of what public culture or state actually meant. So they had to learn at their own expense. They were also risking to be wiped out by the Franks and the Byzantines by the late 6th uh, and early 7th century. But they, that's where the, the moment of the kingdom was properly forged in a way where you cannot, by the way, avoid to see in an acculturation of the people at the hands of the Romans and what you know even you can see it in, in the early Longobard administration that were Roman figures Latin names that were at court and were surely teaching them even how to even how just to write because that that's was something that they didn't know how to do and how can you administrate a land like that uh, that is a you know it has been regimented to civilization from 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 centuries and centuries it works in a very specific way, which is a profitable way that incidentally the longer birds kept alive in in their own way so and and succeeded as we have seen here in this civil development that's a very overlooked history it's, it's something nobody talks about the, 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 the cliches about the longer birds are always uh, the 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 drama of the the fragmentation, which is yet another thing that never existed in the kingdom um because the ducal autonomy has nothing to do with any opposition to the kingdom. And that's yet another thing that you don't hear. Um, of the drama of the religious discrimination, which never happened. There's not even a single instance of that. And actually the, the people Christian, uh, Christianized and Catholicized without problem. Um, these are actually the interesting things that happened. And that, again, if not specialistic historiography talks about. Because, again, you, you, history is not really a personal opinion. And this is what we should get very straight in our mind. That reality is not susceptible to subjective interpretation. Um, and, you know, as if that didn't make any difference. There is a reality and there is only one truth. And these are the things that we discover through reality that make us closer to the truth. People don't treat history like this normally. Um, so, slavery and uh, remained, um, at least served them mostly, that was institutionally and juridically equal to ancient slavery, but something else normally. Mostly, but in, in a minor quantity, with characters of proximity to the master, that is a very close personal connection, that would actually be susceptible to, de to determine a special affection and, and uh, consequently a chance of social 
elevation. Which, which is something that you know happened also in the post Carolingian times. Very often it was actually the, the, the non freemen who were being very close to the senior made a much greater career than the freemen in Massari, in, in the, the, that were theoretically free, but de facto became serfs in the longer run. Uh, in 8th century uh, Italy, this could happen, for example, uh, again, that there's a different context. Here it would happen with, for example, the marriage of an Ancilla handmaid with a freeman, right? That was um, a, a, a frowned up, um, upon case, legally speaking, but the fact it could be resolved in favor of, of their children. Because at the end of the day, who cared for the Ancilla to be, you know, if she was, she was not a, f a free woman. Women were not free in the first place, so who cares? Like the important was ab about their children. His children could become fully free at that point, and so even here it was not much of a contrast in the first place. Even though the law, because the law said something, even if they wanted also to maintain certain balance equilibrium, that they, they, they cared about the moral character of these people. They knew generally speaking that a freeman is a morally superior individual than a serf because just their their life is different but uh, given this improvement of the serfs conditions well of course it was also even easier and, and more natural to have marriages across social status right and on the other side we see also a category of massari that constitute a strong backbone a sort of elite of the rustic, the mm, you know, dependents, with a with complex responsibilities of residence, um, the mm, you know census performance and a complex of conduction of, of the comprehensive conduction of the land, and this position explains the negotial character, also the contractual one of more than one relation between Massari and landowners that were seeing these people as properly responsible for also their own land, and so they counted on them by a certain degree. Thus, the distinction between Servi and Massari seems to be very mobile, permeable, and um, in ever more uh, heading towards one direction, that is, the from the normal, uh, say, from the state of serfdom to the normal peasant dependency, the one of the Massarius, so a, a general enfranchisement. And, um, however, we have also to stress that many Massari still could easily remain serfs, right, which uh, could, uh, would remain for the entire family working on that land. Um, and so, what what happened practically in this is that the uh, master's nucleus of land that in 8th century Italy was known mostly as domo cultile, sundrio, sala, these were things that remained even in the local toponomastics, let's say, um, would ever be kind of ever more detached from the area of, of the Mansi and of the relative farming work because and, and and you understand what the direction is here because um, it's the extension even of some greater power like the oligarchies that were becoming kind of more oligarchic in nature tendentially but they could extend their power mostly on more farms that were however in themselves ever more autonomous right that that the power of these oligarchs would manage to control, but still the, the, the nature of these people was ever more, you know, the one of free farmers fundamentally, that still lived under that clientele, the smarter's clientele. Um, and thus, what you can see is that also in, in, in Longobard times, uh, that seigneurial system that eventually is mostly identified with the post-Carolingian world, or even the Carolingian one proper, um, was forming with the distinction between the Dominicum, so the area properly managed directly by the, the, uh, 
the master that were maybe even serfs properly were more concentrated and the Masaricem said the, the area where the freemen worked and and that however were you know uh, still depending negotially freely in fact uh, from from the from the master in some way from the fr from this other freemen so it was could be a relation between freemen and that's exactly in fact what in even in post colonial Europe would happen initially that many of the, the Masari were factually freemen um, uh, juridically at least and de facto would become ever they would lose ever more of their freedom but because of the collapse there of of any of that very uh, you know limited public authority that had kind of emerged at some point in the empire and that with the end of it would kind of disgregate and um, you know bring the, those people eventually historically to be ever more uh, under right to, to lose properly even their juridical the freedom because of the ca local customs and subjugation and so on. Um, but this process, as you understand, is very fascinating because you can almost photograph through these starters uh, the passage from slavery to some, some kind of freedom, fundamentally, um, on the longer run from late antiquity to longer times. And then this further form of stratification that starts to appear towards the very late Longbert period. I've personally, uh, I've known some some experts in Longbert history, some basically the, mo the you know, the most important uh, uh, in the world, and some of them are biased because they maybe they don't study uh, comprehensively certain things, and especially one always told me that, you know, I remember once I wrote something is that I was saying that fundamentally in this context you could also see the 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 in an embryonal form of what would become something similar to the vassalatic beneficiary system which you don't really find in that same feudal forms but that factually in a clienterly sense had existed and was kind of universal because of course there is as you understand I, I even have this this idea of course that this was more Th this period is more appreciable from from a civil point of view. Excuse me, I drink a little. Rather from that from this wave of reprivatization that was mi very mild indeed, and but still was present, especially if you study the edictum of Rotary and especially the later um, royal editions, especially the ones from Lutbrand. Um, when things were still, you know, pacific in the kingdom, then also Heistulf and Ratkes uh, leg legiferated, but let's say those were moments of war, of disruption, the Franks had also inva uh, had already invaded at some point. The, the thing was falling apart, but in Lutheran's time, you can immediately see that there is some stability, floridity, yes, in, in absolute sense, but also politically a, a slighter and socially also a slighter greater difficulty to control the system that there were abuses corruption um things that the the legislator didn't care about before because even they weren't i mean the, the, there wasn't even enough surplus to do that so the longbirds had created a functional system they wanted to maintain it like that with a strong public culture as a safe steady royal power and they maintained it till Till the end, uh, arguably, at least you know, before they they bought the crown from the Franks. At that point, it was the very last period, the very last king, by the way. But the um, the, the the for 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 that matter, the, this this was a concern that in other countries you wouldn't even have because everything was already private. So it was more a struggle for power that would be ever more military as you, as you understand whereas in this situation you don't find any of this on the contrary you find this very important you know well-being that kind of increases and uh, you know is is um, injecting wealth in, in a system that that has a very interesting socio-economical equilibrium anyhow uh, we'll keep talking about longer about history and society for now we stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content
and for now I thank you heartily for uh, listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye